the Naked DJs podcast. Are they really naked? We know they expose themselves every day just so they can bring you the best of music. They like to stick it out there for everyone to hear. You can hear their podcast on Anchor.fm, YouTube, and any of your favorite podcast platforms. Welcome to the Living the Dream podcast with Curveball. If you believe, you can achieve. achieve, achieve. Welcome to the Living the Dream with Curveball podcast, a show where I interview guests that teach, motivate, and inspire. Today, we're going to be talking about fractional leadership. So for all of you who might be working a full-time job for somebody else and you want to get away from that, this is the episode for you as I am joined by best-selling author and the CEO of fractionalleadership.io, Ben Wolf. Ben's company focuses on sending vetted fractional leaders to small and medium-sized business owners and leaders. Ben, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me, Curtis. I really appreciate it and I'm honored to be here. Well, why don't you start off by telling everybody a little bit about yourself? Will do, will do. I grew up in Nashville, Tennessee and went to, went to college in New York, met my wife up here. And after living a couple of lives, I uh, went to, decided to go to law school while working full time. I went part-time law school at night, thankfully did well. And got a job at one of the New York City, the big law firms, and did that for five years, corporate restructuring and bankruptcy law. Then, you know, took an interesting, after five years, took an interesting detour into the entrepreneurial world and joined a startup, a healthcare startup based in Queens, New York. And we, you know, joined from pre-launch, pre-revenue, right, right as the thing was beginning together with the founder, and I had the privilege of being able to build most of its operations. Uh, it was a healthcare or home care related business, and I didn't have an entrepreneurial background, so really just had to figure it out as we went along and grew that business to, by the time I left, the largest organization, the largest organization of its category in the entire state of New York, and over 130 people by the time I left, so really saw a lot of growth a lot of changes and a lot of different challenges that you have at all different size companies, all different size startups. And after I left there, I hung up my shingle as a fractional, meaning an outsourced or part-time chief operating officer to come in and help small and mid-sized businesses as their COO when they couldn't afford to hire a COO full-time that was experienced that had done this before. And after a lot of hustling, a lot of work, ultimately eventually got fully busy with clients, continued getting leads, started referring those out to other people, my you know, quote unquote competitors, and ultimately turned that into a firm and started actually bringing other fractional COOs into my company, Wolf's Edge Consulting. And, and so now I have a fractional integrator, fractional COO firm. And just being in that whole world exposed me to this whole world of fractional executives, what I call fractional leaders now. And, you know, there's firms of over 100 people doing that in marketing, sales, operations, finance technology, meaning CMOs, VPs of sales, COOs, CFOs, and technology people, CTOs, and CIOs, all the alphabet soup of, of different C level titles. And, I really just saw that there's thousands of people doing this now. It's getting more and more common, especially after COVID and people being able to be work virtually and, and work with people all over the country, not just be limited to people in your local area and not only just limited to finding clients in your local area, thousands of people doing this. I just realized and found that there was no book on the topic. There's no common terminology, terminology, excuse me, just a totally lack of any center of gravity in this whole industry. So I was like, well, no one else is doing it. I might as well do it. So I wrote the book, Fractional Leadership, Landing Executive Talent You Thought Was Out of Reach, the first comprehensive book for business owners and leaders about what fractional leadership is, how it works, what it does for businesses, why they do it, if it's for you, if it's for them, if it's not for them, how it works. 
and started this company. As Curtis so graciously said, as you said in your introduction, and in this business, yeah, as you as you said, I actually created a whole community of fractional leaders. We do you know peer advisory, networking opportunities, professional development opportunities, so people can get better as fractional executives and connect to others, learn from others, and and also set up a process for marketing to business owners and then referring these fractional leaders and those that have fully vetted, meaning I've checked three of their references or my team has checked three of their references, then we refer them to those business owners. And yeah, I mean, that's, I guess, the basic context for what I've been, where I've been up to and how I got up to where I'm doing now. Well, tell us what fractional leadership is, how it works. And is this a term that you made up? And if it is a term that you made up, why did you decide to call it that? Or is it just a term in the in their work industry? Yeah, a great question. So first of all, in terms of the term fractional leadership, I did trademark it. You know, it's, you could call it a lot of things. You could call it fractional executive. You could call it, you know, I don't know. You can call it all kinds of things. A lot of people do use the word fractional, but they also use words like outsourced or part-time or interim. A lot of words people use, you know, executives or, you know, People use all kinds of terminology, and that's actually part of the issue. If somebody wants to know about bringing a fractional executive, fractional leader into their company, Google something. You Google some term that you think of or that you heard, and you're only going to get a portion of the people that's going to come up in the Google search because there's no common terminology. So that's part of what I'm trying to do, actually, is create a common terminology. So I just picked a pretty good term and trademarked it, and that's the term I'm using. That's why I call the book Fractional Leadership. So it's partially made up, but it's it's whatever in terms of the term. But what is it? What, is, what the heck is fractional leadership? So that means essentially when people bring someone into their company as a C-level position, meaning executive level position, COO, CMO, CFO, et cetera, but they just do so on a fractional, meaning part-time basis rather than full-time. That's really all it means. The person, it still means just like when you hire somebody, it means that they're responsible. If it's a CFO, they're responsible for your financial operations and analysis. If it's a CMO, it means they're responsible for your marketing. That's different from a consultant where typically a consultant, let's say a marketing consultant, they work on a project for you. I'll build your website. I'll make your video and that's it. Or I'll run your social media or something like that. They take on either one finite project or an ongoing project that's very specific and limited in scope. That differs from your actual CMO, your chief marketing officer, for example, because your chief marketing officer is your chief marketing officer. Whatever marketing you do, they're responsible for all of it, whatever it ends up entailing. So that's what a fractional leader or fractional executive is. It's just like your CMO, just they manage to, to manage their time manage your resources, meaning your marketing staff or your financial staff, like your bookkeeper, your controller, manage those people or even external resources, like an external controller, external bookkeeper, external marketing agencies, whatever in each category. And they manage those people, manage those resources, either internal or external, whether vendors or employees, and they manage them and manage to get you results. They just do it on a part-time basis. They organize their time in, in a way that enables them to do that. And very often, the reason why you people bring on, you know, the reason why people hire a fractional CMO is really the same reason they would hire a CMO or the reason they hire a fractional CFO is because they, same reason they would hire a CFO. They need higher level resources, people that have done this before. Because right now, most business owners, honestly, what they find themselves doing, they've never done this before. They're just figuring it out. They're everything they learn to do. They're just reinventing the wheel. And sometimes at a certain scale, when they're trying to get bigger, at some point that just becomes a diminishing rate of returns. It's just not worth it. It's not a good use of their time to reinvent the wheel. It's more worth it for them to use a certain amount of revenue, a certain amount of money to pay someone who actually has done this before. And they could just move much, 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 much faster and get results much quick, much more quickly and much more effectively than just trying to figure things out themselves, or if they have another member of their leadership team that's also never done this before and have that person try to figure it out themselves. So it's a, it's kind of like a shortcut to getting very experienced executive leadership, like taking your company to the next level. And But instead of paying the $250,000, $300,000 it would cost to hire someone like that full-time, uh, you could pay a fraction of that, 
have someone like that part-time a day a week, let's say. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah, it does. So you have to have the same experience and degrees and stuff, except like you say, instead of being full-time getting 300,000, you do it on a part-time basis. Mm -hmm. So so speaking of that, why do you feel like owners feel like C-level talent is out of their budget? Well, I mean, it, because it really is. I mean, it's, you know, if you think of, if you think of a small mid-sized business, I mean, they're struggling, you know, they may have two, three, five, 10 million in, in revenue, you know, just as much expensive profits are very tight, very limited. And they simply could not afford to take on a, a giant nut like that, that they have to pay every month and all the benefits and taxes that go with it, just not worth it. Plus very often, if you have a company with 25, 50, a hundred people in it, Typically, they don't, they don't really, they don't even have full-time work to do for if they would hire a full-time CFO. They just, it's not actually a full-time job much of the time. So that's, that's a couple of the reasons. They really can't afford it, number one. And number two, even if they, even if sometimes, even if they could, there's really not full-time work to do. So, you know, to do it in a more scalable way to take a baby step towards that big obligation of giant salary like that, which is very hard for people. They could take a baby step or an intermediate step of bringing on a fractional executive, CFO, CMO, COO, et cetera, for, you know, maybe for a year or two. And then that person can help them scale up much faster than they could have without that person's skill and leadership and experience. And then they can help work themselves out of the job and and, and bring in and find somebody full-time. You know, people go into this to become fractional executives, fractional leaders, because typically they they, uh, you know, they've done the job full time before, often for many years, sometimes for an entire career, and they're doing it now and fractionally in retirement stage. So you're getting really, really experienced executive people, but they're just tired. They don't want to do it full time anymore with all the pressure, you know, of, of the late nights and, and the craziness of doing it full time. They'd rather do it part time for multiple companies. And then they get to do the more fun part, right? They get to do the major change do that for a year or two. And then when things stabilize, when they have success, move on, you know, transition over to somebody full-time or somebody internally, and then switch on to the next exciting project. And so they always get to do the exciting parts, the more interesting parts of the job, rather than kind of just the maintenance of once you've built something. It's one of the reasons why I left my full-time role. I mean, it was pretty successful, built amazing things there. We did great things with that organization, but at some point I just started, you know, it was full-time. At some point, built crazy things, but at some point I just started to feel like I'm just maintaining it. Like it just wasn't interesting, wasn't satisfying anymore. So if that feels like you, I mean, you know, thinking about doing consulting or, or going in as an, a fractional executive with somebody could be, you know, could be an option that you might want to think about. Well, let's talk about the five questions that you feel that business owners should ask themselves when they're trying to determine whether they should hire a fractional leader or not? Well, that's a great question. The, you know, I mentioned a couple of them here. The, one of the more relevant ones comes up for people is the fact that they, is the fact that they are, people have a difficult time finding the right person for them has the right experience, the right industry experience. It's a good fit for them personality wise as a business owner a leader who happens to live within 10 miles or whatever of, of their home base. Very often you just can't find the right person that close, even fractionally, but you have to, you know, but very often if you open yourself up to working with somebody virtually, obviously you open yourself up to a whole nother batch of talent. There's people around the country that might be a better fit for you, the best fit for you, but they would, if they don't live nearby, they would be working with you virtually And so one of the reasons why some business owners, you know, fractional leadership doesn't work for them is, is if the, you know, the right person's not available locally and, and their entire leadership team that maybe, maybe the whole company is all local. It's all completely in person. And, you know, people, you just aren't willing to, or just don't feel comfortable making the adjustments that are necessary to, you know, to, to kind of make it work with working with somebody virtually on your leadership team. I mean, that's a pretty intimate connection. And if you're not willing to do that, or you don't feel able to do that, just not in your DNA, then it may not work. 
And then, you know, obviously we could talk about, if you want to, alternatives that they could look into what they need that experience leadership, but they can't find it fractionally locally. They can't find it full-time or they can't afford full-time and they can't, and they just don't feel like it's in their DNA to make it work with somebody virtually, you know, remotely. Then, you know, they have to consider what their alternatives are because obviously they're going to suffer since they need it, but can't get it or don't feel like the, like they can get it. So that's one kind of factor is if people are just not easily able to work with virtual or remote team members, that's one issue that it might not be for you, you know, but if you can do that, but a lot of people discovered after COVID, especially they thought they could never work with somebody remotely, but then they found when COVID came along, they found that when they were forced to, a lot of people who previously thought they couldn't deal with it, found out, you know, it's not that bad. You can do it, you know? And, and so so a lot more people came, became open to it, especially after COVID, opened themselves up to talent all over the place. And I've certainly found that in my experience. I'll mention one other, one other question to ask yourself of why it may or may not work is, can you back up somebody, especially somebody who's not there full time, can you back them up? Like, let's say it's, let's take the example of a chief sales officer or a VP of sales that you bring in as a sales leader, fractionally. So if the sales team, you know, they're going to work with you, work with the sales team to kind of set up a sales process, set up metrics, set up a certain way of doing things, set up maybe a CRM system that they're going to track their sales activities in and leads in. And if, you know, the salespeople, let's say, are going to come to you, you know, come to the business owner and say like, hey, you know, let's say the, the VP of sales is named Curtis, right? So let's say Curtis said that we, you know, that we're supposed to log all our calls in here, but oh, that's such a drag. Do you really have to do that? And then you're like, oh yeah, no, don't worry about it. You know, like you don't back them up. You don't back up the processes that there's a reason for. You don't back them up. You, you facilitate and you allow end runs around everything they're trying to do and everything they're trying to do to help you really. Yeah, or they, you know, you know, whether they allow end runs or maybe they initiate even end runs around what the fractional executive you brought in is trying to do. And then you end up undercutting all the efforts they're trying to do for your sake, your sake as the business owner, I mean. And, um, and so you yeah, have to ask yourself, are you able to back some, are you able to back up, a, you know, if you bring in a fractional executive, if you decide to retain somebody, are you willing to back them up? you know, work closely with them, talk about any concerns you have. And after working through those concerns, are you willing to back them up? Or are you going to kind of go around them and undermine them? And sometimes people just know themselves that they don't have the ability to resist or they, they shouldn't resist or for whatever reason. And if that's the case, then the engagement really would be doomed to failure and you shouldn't go into it. I should do something else that you do have the ability to do, maybe full time or I don't know what else, you know, think about what other options you have, but look at other options because, no point in engaging in something which, you know, is should be your actions would doom to failure in advance. So it's a couple of reasons why, you know, potentially would not be a good fit for certain, certain types of business owners. Tell us what strategic and tactical leadership give us the definitions for those and tell us the differences between them. Sure. So, you know, there's, there's, you know, I guess I would say there's there's getting stuff done and then there's strategic leadership. Now, if you just need like a body or a brain or a keyboard and hands and a mouth and ears to just get stuff done, to make calls, to, you know, figure out your new CRM and implement it, or you just need somebody to get stuff done, then, you know, which may legitimately be what you need, then hiring a fractional executive is probably not the right match for you because fractional executives they cost a lot more than getter donors, right? Because <laughs> they're executive level. They have, you know, years or decades of experience leading organizations like yours or leading major functions of organizations like 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 yours or like the business owners. And and so their highest and best use, you know, is not going to be a waste of their talents and, and the main and not going to be a waste of the main value that they that they bring to you is 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 in using them for strategic leadership for setting, setting up systems, setting up strategies, deciding what's the right thing to do and helping roll it out and drive accountability, not just get stuff done personally themselves, not just be workers. So that's going to be their highest and best use for you, the best use of the money you spend on them, the, the business owner spends on them. And I would say that getting done leadership or just getting stuff done is, 
is, you know, is just not what you'd use a fractional executive for. It's, you know, there's all kinds of consultants and freelancers and employees or part-time employees that you could use for that, even managers that you could use for that, that would be, you know, that you would spend less money on and it would be money appropriately spent for, for that kind of resource, for that kind of work that needs to get done. And so, you know, it's really just a matter of using people at their highest and best use. And that's actually an example of something I would do is, you know, sometimes you have a team where they can't afford a fractional leader. They can't afford a full-time executive and they don't want to hire somebody virtually. Yeah. You know, sometimes what people need, well, another example, you know what a better example is, is come across some leaders and, and founders who are, who come looking potentially for a fractional executive, a COO or something else. And what they find in, and we find is that sometimes if they're like on their own, they have no leadership team. They really have no one else of a high caliber who can like take ownership of major functions of the business, uh, you know, besides themselves. So they're really on their own. They have a bunch of workers, whatever kind of business it is. I mean, whether it's financial advising or, you know, HVAC installation, construction, anything else, they have workers, people who can get stuff done, but not, but not leaders, not people who can own major functions of the business, own the getting done properly of major functions of the business, like marketing, operations, finance, technology, whatever. So, so, so sometimes like, you know, to bring a fractional executive in when you really have no leadership team, nobody full-time who, who you could count on to kind of, take over ownership off of your shoulders or the founder's shoulders, parts of the business of major functions of the business, then it may be too soon to get a fractional leader. It's another answer to your earlier question. And, and so, you know, I would say sometimes I tell people in that circumstance that really what they need is just, you know, to get a manager, hire a full-time person, hire a manager, get more people who could take over, who could delegate some of the ownership of the function to. So you could take more off of yourself. Maybe they could ultimately be a member of the leadership team. They could work up to it. And you're probably not ready for fractional executive yet. But I guess I would say that strategic versus tactical leadership, it's a matter of getting stuff done versus strategic leadership and driving of getting stuff done. And when you're bringing in somebody as executive, whether fractional or full-time, you know, you should make sure that you are ready and what you need is, and it's not that bad fit for you, but what you actually need is that strategic leadership, someone to strategize and then drive and execute what's been strategized rather than just somebody to get stuff done. You can't replace that leadership function. Well, tell us about your book and your podcast and how we can listen to that podcast and get a hold of that book. Sure. Well, you can, you can find out about everything on my website, fractionalleadership.io. There's a page there about the book, about the podcast, and a blog also. And uh, again, fractionalleadership.io, and uh, where you could just search Google Fractional Leadership. And uh, yeah, I mean, the book, like I said earlier, it's, it's an interesting thing. We just discovered that out of, you know, there's thousands of people doing this. There's been various kinds of fractional leadership going on for decades and just realized I, I couldn't even believe it when I first Googled, when I first had the idea for the book, I was like, oh, someone must have written a book like this before. So I Googled it and I searched on Amazon and I Googled in all different words because you know, there's all different terminologies people use. So I Googled it, you know, 10 different ways and realized that nobody had written this book about fractional leadership. So I, I decided I would write it. It was it just hadn't been done yet. So there was really no guide from the ground up that business owners could read, you know, to figure out what the heck is fractional leadership or, you know, fractional executive work. What even is that? How does it work? Why do people do it? What's the benefit of it? And, you know, and, and once you understand that, is it for me? Is it not for me? Is it, is it, you know, how do I find the right fractional leader? How do I set up the engagement for success? And, how does it work? How does the marketing, sales, operations, finance, technology work in terms of fractional leadership? And so I decided to, to write the book on that. And you know, so I wrote the first book on that. It came out in early October this year when this podcast was released, 2021. And, and uh, look, I know your, your podcast is aimed towards uh, inspiring and, and informing people. And so, you know, I just, look, I have not been doing fractional leadership longer than a lot of people I know. I know people have been doing it for decades and, you know, any, anybody listening to this 
can do the same thing. You know, you don't have to be the greatest or the best or doing it the longest. You know, if you see it, if you see a need out there, if you see a gap in the world, then you can strive to fill it. You don't need to ask anybody's permission or you don't need to quote unquote deserve it in some sense. You just educate yourself, prepare, do the most excellent job you can. And whatever the gap is, just, you know, endeavor to fill it. You know, it's, you know, if I could do it. Anybody could do it. It's really, you know, I don't have any special background, just found something that, you know, I knew something about, knew a lot of people who do it, interviewed a lot of people also to get stories and quotes and ideas. And, you know, I think anybody could do, anybody could do the same thing. So for those who are or want to be fractional leaders, how do you go about finding clients? Well, that is the $64,000 question. (laughs) Obviously, you know, anybody who wants to make the transition from full-time to fractional can be very tough. If you're younger, you know, so in terms of fractional leadership, I'll I'll, I'll give an example there and maybe I'll broaden this out for a second because in fractional leadership, it's, it's an executive level position. So you really, I don't really believe you can have credibility as a fractional leader or a fractional executive if you haven't done that executive role that you want to do fractionally full-time before. You have to have a few years experience being a successful CFO. I mean, obviously you work your way, you can work your way up, however that works, but you have to be a fractional CFO for a while. Or if you want to be a CMO fractionally, you have to be a fractional CMO full-time before. And so that's one thing I would say. And if you want to do what I'll get to kind of generally, because you, you could go independent in other kinds of work too, not just executive level work. So I'll speak about that in a second. But, but you know, the way you get clients with any kind of consulting work or with fractional executive leadership work is similar or coaching. It's really all the same kind of work is you have to hustle. I mean, what I did when I first started, you just hustle, 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 hustle. You have to have persistence, just relentless persistence. It's not a, it's not a very sexy thing to say, but like, that's how it worked. Like it doesn't happen automatically. You don't just change your profile on LinkedIn and it doesn't just happen. You know, what I did was, you know, I made a list of everybody that I knew, everybody that I know, you know, even remotely knew who may either be a potential client or a potential referral source for clients and reached out to people, ask them for a call. And I just had calls. I mean, that was before Zoom. So most of them were on the phone at the beginning. But now all my calls are on Zoom. But, but I, you know, just started having calls, telling people what I'm doing now. And I set up metrics for myself, right? The only way you could do it, I think, is if you create accountability for yourself. I set up a metric for myself. I encourage people to imitate something like this that, you know, in some form that works for them, which is I started ticking off everybody I sent an email to or a LinkedIn very customized message to, to say, you know, to ask for a call. And I did 30 of those a week. And I just kept that up every week, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30. It has a very cumulative effect over time. And a lot of those things ended up leading to calls. So I got on calls with people and found out what they're doing, what their issues are, let them know what I'm up to now. Cause if you're going to be doing something different from what you did before, you need to educate people. You need to reprogram what box in their mind to put you in like when they should refer you to somebody. And they can only do that if they remember the new box that you're now in, you know, that you're a finance consultant or you're a fractional CFO or a fractional CMO or COO or CTO, et cetera. So, you know, and then you got to just keep those things up. I set a minimum number of calls that I did every week. I think it was 10 for a long time. Although at the very beginning, I had 12 to 18 calls a week from all these reach outs I was doing. And then, and then you just keep it up because people, if you have one call, they're going to forget about you. It's all about persistence. People who don't seem like a good referral source, just forget about them. A lot of people will introduce you to other people, even, even other referral sources very often, not just potential clients. And so follow up with those people, make calls with them and get to know people, set up some kind of system on an Excel spreadsheet or a free CRM like HubSpot or whatever CRM you want and track your work. Make sure you're doing those 30 or whatever number reach outs to people every week. Make sure you're adding value for the people you're reaching out to. You're helping them. You're giving them referrals, giving them recommendations for things that they need, even if it's not what you do. Just by being helpful for people in the world, ultimately, it's going to come back to you. So keep helping, keep reaching out, keep having calls with people. And again, after one or two calls and a couple emails, they're not going to remember what you do. They're not going to remember to refer you. It's after three, six eight months, 
and three or four calls and you know a bunch of emails helping them out, sending them an interesting article that they finally start to remember. Oh yeah, now I remember Curtis or whoever you, whoever it is. I'm just using your name, Curtis, but they, you know, oh yeah, that person does that here. I got somebody that can help you. You know, six months later, they'll start remembering you. It's tough to transition from full-time, especially if you have a family to support or a lot of obligations. A lot of times you have to do the business development, which takes hours a week on top of your full-time job, all the calls, the reach outs. And then, and then if you can't get a client as a side hustle, because again, you can't afford to just quit. If you have a lot of obligations, a lot of people can't just afford to quit. So you got to really hustle, work long hours, doing your full-time job, doing all your reach outs, your business development, and then even more work to do that side hustle. And then on top of that, continuing to do business development. And then, you know, one thing I suggest to people is get a, get a, you know, when you book that second client, let's say starting in two weeks, then you put in your notice to quit your job, and then you quit with two clients. There's one way to, one way to do it. Another good piece of advice I've gotten, especially if you have a full-time job, you may be able to get a loan from the bank, either an unsecured loan based on your income or a, or a home equity loan. If you, if you have a home and if you have equity, you spare equity. It's some kind of loan, again, just as a buffer or set aside some savings if you can. Just kind of have a buffer. So when you do quit, and just to kind of buffer that risk, because if you have some big obligations, then you can't just, you know, you can't just be reckless. I mentioned before I would get to regular consulting or things other than fractional executive work. If you want to go independently, leave a full-time job, be a freelancer, be a consultant, same basic principle. You do the same things we said earlier in terms of business development, just in terms of you'll just do that with your freelance gig or your, you know, turn your side hustle into a full-time hustle or with your consulting business or whatever it happens to be. Curtis, I may have gone a little too long on what you intended on that question, but I hope that's helpful for people, you know? Yes, that was helpful information. So I'm glad you kind of expanded on that. Tell us about some current or upcoming projects that you're working on that people need to know about. Well, I appreciate it. Look, if you, if you have anybody out there that is that is doing, you know, that's doing executive level work in one of these areas, again, marketing, sales, finance, operations, technology, then, you know, you could go to fractionalleadership.io. There's a group of fractional leaders we have there. You could look into that more. You can certainly read my book if you want to understand more about it. Again, go to fractionalleadership.io or just search on Amazon for fractional leadership, landing executive talent you thought was out of reach, or just search fractional leadership, you'll find it. We actually have that on Kindle, on paperback, on hardcover, and we actually have an audio book on Audible coming out any day now. And uh, so hopefully that'll be available soon for those who like audiobooks, uh, which I happen to, all my books I read basically on Audible. And, and yeah, so just check out fractionalleadership.io a link there to the book, to the podcast, to the blog. Subscribe to the newsletter if you want to keep up to what we're doing. Give us some final thoughts to close it out. Anything that I have missed that you would like to talk about or just some final thoughts? I appreciate it. The, I guess I would just say that if you are a full-time person and you're kind of sick of working full-time for somebody else and having 100% of your eggs in one basket, right? You only have one client. If you have, if something doesn't work out with them or you get fired or they go out of business or some other issue or the position gets eliminated, it's hundred percent of your eggs in one basket. So there is a certain, once you get established as a fractional executive or any kind of consultant or, or gig economy type of person, once you get a full book of business, you have a lot less risk than a full-time job because your risk is mixed among many different clients. You actually make more money doing that if you're charging appropriately than you would full-time. If you think about it by the hour, you do make more money and you have more flexibility and you get to do more exciting work. So for those who are thinking about doing something like that, I definitely, definitely recommend it. And, you know, I just encourage you that if you're willing to put in the work, if you're willing to hustle and, and recognize that, you know, you got to be willing in advance to kind of realize there's going to be a bunch of months of things are going to be harder before they get to be kind of a better lifestyle. If you're willing to go, for, you know, if you're willing to commit to that, to invest that extra time and that hustle, and if you have the persistence, then you will ultimately be successful. The key is just not giving up. You just have to be willing to put in the commitment to your own success without giving up, and then you will succeed eventually. It doesn't always happen quickly, but it will happen. Ladies and gentlemen, fractionalleadership.io. Go check out the site, the book, 
the podcast, and maybe you can be the next successful fractional leader. Ben, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. Well, Curtis, I really appreciate you having me. I love your voice, by the way. It's so mellifluous and, and comforting. You have a beautiful voice and just honored that you had me on. Thank you. Appreciate you as well. And mellifluous, never heard of that word. <laughs> but listeners, please be sure to follow, rate, review, <laughs> share after listening. And Android listeners, go to the Google Play Store and download the Living a Dream with Curveball podcast app. For more information on the Living the Dream podcast, visit www.djcurveball.com. Until next time, stay focused on living the dream. dream.